How is birth rate decreased and death rate increased as populations increase in size? Populations don't increase indefinitely in the real world, as we said in the last little lecture. If populations do grow and grow and grow, things get kind of crowded. And crowding leads to density dependence. More individuals mean less food for each and for their offspring. Social strife increases. Diseases spread more easily and predators are more likely to spot their prey in big groups. So these and other factors all slow down and eventually halt population growth. So we can use the basic equation modifying B and D to reflect crowding. So that B, the birth rate, is diminished by a factor of A times N, which decreases as population size increases, and D is modified by a constant C times N, and that quantity increases as the population size increases. So that dn dt is equal to the birth rate modified by the crowding factor minus the death rate, which is increased by the crowding factor times the population size. We rearrange stuff and we can define a new constant, which is k, the carrying capacity. Now, why it doesn't start with c, I don't know. I guess the, the language it was first described in. The carrying capacity is the birth rate minus the death rate over these two, the sum of the two constants. And the carrying capacity is defined for each species as the number of individuals of that species that the environment can support. So if we put k back into the equation, we get dn dt is equal to little r times n, as before, times 1 minus population size over carrying capacity. In a way, you can think of this as the unused portion of the carrying capacity. If n is close to k, the carrying capacity, that quantity is very small and population will grow very slowly. If n is far from k, then that's a bigger number and the population will grow rapidly. So here's the population growth curve, exponential growth up to a, an inflection point and then growing more slowly and not surpassing the carrying capacity. So in the exponential model, populations stop growing or don't grow when the population size is zero or little r was equal to zero. In the logistic model, the model with a limit, when n equals k, the, when population size equals the carrying capacity, populations will stop growing. The time that it takes the population size to reach the carrying capacity is proportional to the intrinsic rate of increase. A higher little r will lead to that reaching the carrying capacity sooner. So I mentioned the inflection point. This little graph shows it very nicely. Population growth in the first phase, in the lower left quadrant, is exponential to a point where the effects of the limits to the environment are starting to be felt at half the carrying capacity. Population growth starts to slow and eventually levels off. So the logistic model also has some assumptions, though not quite as simple as the exponential model. This one also has no time lags, migration, no genetic variation, no age structure. Because we assume that resources are limited, constant carrying capacity is um, assumed, 
and linear density dependence. That is, each individual of the species leads to the same incremental decrease in resources available for all the others. There's long been a debate among ecologists as to which group of factors are most important in regulating populations, density-dependent factors or density-independent factors. Let's look at what both those things are. With density dependence, the number of individuals can be set by the amount of food that's available, and it's competition within a species that regulates the population size. So there have been a number of empirical analyses, but very famous ones are those by Nicholson on insects, Charles Elton on voles, and Andrew Lack with birds, their predators, and disease. And he is the one who authored a book, The Natural Regulation of Animal Numbers. The alternative view is that the physical environment is the most important thing at regulating animal numbers, density independent regulation. And the book called The Distribution and Abundance of Animals by Andra Wartha and Birch uh, championed this. And if you look at certain groups of insects especially, their numbers are influenced or they correspond very well with weather patterns. For example, thrips in flowers, they increase in number until there's a freeze, but a few thrips survive somewhere, so as conditions warm up, the population increases again. Where they would persist through bad weather is called a refuge, and so the population size is set by the number of refugia as well as the limits of the environment in terms of weather extremes in this case. So the defenders of density dependence and the those who champion density independence came to some sort of a truce, recognizing that both physical and biological factors interact to regulate population growth rate. Because after all, some of the factors that increase in intensity as density goes up are those that might be interpreted as density-independent factors. The bigger the population size, the fewer favorable sites are available per individual, for one thing. So it's not really density independence versus density dependence, but rather, on the one hand, weather and physical factors, non-living things, versus, on the other hand, food, predators, and disease. More living things are things that... Um, organisms might fight about. One really interesting uh, way of looking at populations and what regulates them is key factor analysis, where you can consider all the life history stages of an organism, in this case uh, an insect with the different life stages, egg, larva, pupa, adult, and all the different factors, the amount of rainfall or humidity, this predator, that predator, that parasitoid. And you can write an equation that the log of the population size at the next time interval would be the log of the population size at this time, plus the log of fecundity, plus the log of all of these different mortality factors. And each of the mortality factors can be said to have a killing power so that density dependent mortality you might doing this kind of analysis you could find that certain factors are much more important regulating populations than others objections to this are that it takes a long time to get good enough data in any system you want to study and some of the impeccable big data sets may not have been as good as they would thought. Some scientists pointed out that 
factors can counterbalance each other, and you might not detect that with the, the equation as expressed. But basically, a very long time series of field data are needed to get a good handle on which of the killing factors are most important. And of course, things can change over time. I want to point out that density dependence isn't only negative. You know, if there are more individuals, things are worse for a, a species. There's more competition. But certain organisms do better when the populations are bigger. Maybe more mates around, more pollinators are attracted for plants. But with this Primula Veris data set, the number of fruits produced per fruits per flower, probably that means fruits per plant, increases the number of seeds also, and seed set for individual fruits. And interestingly, seed mass declines, but there is a trade-off between number and size in seeds. It's an interesting phenomenon in plant populations that as plants grow bigger, the populations undergo what is called self-thinning, so that fewer plants survive and they get bigger, but probably by some plants getting bigger, the smaller ones are killed. So if you look over time, and the picture at the lower left, the time series goes from... November through the winter into the spring and summer, there are lots of little individual plants, 10 to the fifth power, and they're very small to start with, and then fewer and fewer and fewer, but they get bigger and bigger, the surviving ones. That's called self-thinning. Self-thinning is the relationship between the number surviving and the mean dry weight of the survivors. So this drawing shows lots of little ones on the right, then as they get bigger, fewer survive, and still fewer when they're very big. So the slope of this line, the self-thinning curve, is negative 3 over 2. And this so-called negative 3 halves power law is shown in all kinds of plants here in this chart for two very different plants of the California and the California ecosystem, Amaranthus retroflexus and Kenopodium album. Both start out in the lower right with a number of small individuals and as time goes by, fewer individuals survive, but the average biomass is much greater.